Um, good morning, dear fellows. I hope you are all well and I hope you're all ready for today's session. Dumelang, Saubona, Bu Itahani, Molo. So, a very warm welcome to all of you. So, today we will be focusing on how to compile a winning funding proposal. Now, besides um, selecting a discipline, um, choosing your supervisor and searching the literature. These aspects are also important to know and to be knowledgeable about when you start applying for funding, because to apply for funding, you need to search the literature well. You need to have good collaborators, good people you're working with, and also you need a good research question. OK, so all of these topics that we are presenting, this all forms a very coherent type of um, coherent system of knowledge that you need to accumulate for yourself. And compiling um, funding proposals will be covering um, different aspects of this, how to plan for this, how to write the actual application. And it's important also to remember that when it comes to funding, it's very diverse. One can apply for scholarships, one can apply for fellowships, one can apply for visiting fellowships to visit other labs, you can apply for funding, uh, travel funding to attend conferences. You can, if you get more senior, you can apply for equipment and you can also apply to cover student bursaries. So it's, it's a very wide scope um, of different aspects under the funding umbrella um, types of proposals that you can write and apply for. So many of the points we are going to mention here today is related to all of this. So you need to learn this um, at a very, very early stage in your career. This is extremely important so that you can get funding already very early in your career. This is very important for your development also. Then, as I mentioned, what we're going to discuss today here, besides this, there's a whole range of information, articles, books, um, videos that are available in the net. So try and supplement your knowledge with what I'm telling you today with also other knowledge available on the internet, good books. Also, there's a good section um, in the nature, in the nature journal called Nature Careers column. Go and have a read at that article. Some of that covers funding. Um, that's very important to have a read. I remember reading a very interesting article about a young fellow. Um, he applied for the funding, but then someone else took the idea and he got the funding for it. So one has to read this type of article to get a broad knowledge about how to protect ideas, um, how to take this type of idea forward and how to apply for the grant and how to um, then be successful in the application. So what we'll be focusing on today is what the funding application entails and also writing a winning application. So these are some of the major points that we will be discussing today. Now, first of all, planning is very, very important. When one wants to apply for funding, you have to start planning very, very early. So if there's a call, um, make sure that you start to plan and write the proposal and discuss it and edit it already well in advance before you have submit to, to have submitted because sometimes these documents have to go through approvals at the different uh, management offices. It has to go through um, the intellectual property office. So um, there's various rules and regulations that you need to follow before you can actually submit the application. Then also you need to develop your proposal. Um, it's like writing. If you if you have a first draft of a paper or a literature review, the first draft is not always perfect. Don't worry. You will have to go through many drafts. You'll edit. You'll share it with your writers, and there will be many edits being completed on the first draft. And eventually, after five or so drafts, you will end up with something that you're happy and that you will submit. Then it's also important after um, you've submitted it to follow up on the status and when you will receive feedback on the outcome of your application. 
Now, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different workshops, international grant writing workshops. Um, there's books available like this book is a good one. The Grant Application Writers Workbook. Unfortunately, this you can um, only um, access this through payment. I don't have unfortunately have a PDF copy of this, but there may be some other um, review articles on Google Scholar. Um, etc. Also look in your different disciplines, um, how people write grants, because it may differ also from discipline to discipline, for example, the how you describe the methodology. In science, for example, you will describe the methodology differently, that you will have to um, explain what chemicals you used, how you retrieved uh, or um, collected your samples, how you analyzed them, how you treated them and how you statistically analyzed them. For example, if you do medical studies, you have to get ethical approval first. You will have a patient population. There has to be inclusion and exclusion criteria. You will have screening tools that you screen the patients with. For example, if you're working in psychology, you will have to use uh, screening test batteries, and this needs to be tested for reliability and, um, and all sorts of other metrics. So have a look at how people in your field write grants, because it may differ from field to field, although the approach to it is generally the same, what information you need to include, but the content may, may differ and the approach may differ also a bit. So also ask your supervisor if he can share with you successful um, applications so you can learn how the stuff is, writen, is written and what to include under the different sections. OK, so let's first look at what is actually a grant or what is funding? So a grant is a mechanism by which an agency awards money to fund research. It can be to fund a research visit, a fellowship, a scholarship, equipment, a travel grant to a conference, etc. It can also be to fund an educational program. Sometimes you get grants that funds this. Also, you get grants for organizing workshops. So there's different types of research grants. Now, this is basically the giving of funds for a specific purpose. For example, you are uh, obtaining money to um, procure consumables and to publish paper for a specific research project. Some of the grants also covers your salary, like some fellowships will cover your salary and and research cost, but you need to find out in the guidelines of a grant what the grant actually covers. Is it only for research? Will it cover salaries also? Will it cover travel? Will it cover publication? Because publication costs, remember, when you publish in open access journals, there is a huge APC or the article processing charge. Sometimes this can reach up to 50,000 Rand and it's, include, it's important to apply for such funds so that you can publish your papers open access. There's also different grants specifically dedicated for publishing open access. You can also ask the publisher of the journal to which you will submit your paper if they have something like this. OK, so this is also the relationship between a grantor and the grantee is an exchange relationship. It varies depending on the type of grant. Remember, it's not a gift. And remember also very importantly, it's 80 percent planning and 20 percent writing. Now, some people may differ on that. Um, some people may agree that it's only, say, for example, 40 percent planning and 60 percent writing. That all depends on how well your writing skills are. And writing skills are very, very important, not only for writing grants, but also to write papers, to write literature reviews. So whenever you see the library offering you a research writing workshop, please go and attend that so you can learn how to write. Because everyone, even me, when I started writing, it was difficult. I struggled. I didn't know how to construct my sentences. My first draft, um, I remember as an honor student, was not so good. But you learn. As you grow, as you get older, you learn. Because you exchange knowledge, you go to workshops, you write. This is the only way to learn. You have to actually write stuff. So now um, let's look into why you actually apply for the grant. And this is very important. It's to advance your scientific knowledge in your field. It's to advance your career. Because one day, if you want to stay in academia, 
your CV, the people who review your application will want to see that this person is capable of getting grants to fund their research. So a grant also means that experts in the field acknowledge your idea as important and worthy of public or private support. Right now, this issue, this is a bit deviating from the main point here, but one should always remember that when one publishes, one should also publish your work in popular science journals like The Conversation, etc. Now, why is this important? Because our research is being funded by the public. So if we don't share our research with the public and we only share the research with um, acad academicians or in the academia field, who is going to fund us? So this is very important. Also, um, we'll be discussing a bit later that um, uh, grant sources monies come from different types of um, avenues. It can come from the public, it can come from private, it can come from government, it can come from industry as well. And applying for industry grants is actually very beneficial because you can um, attend uh, uh, internships and they can actually fund your project if it's linked to some technology that they want to develop and sell. So, um, it also means an enhanced prestige of your institution. It means a contribution to the financial health of your department or your university. A grant means new opportunities for your research assistants, or if you're a senior person for your students, it will provide scholarships and funding for them to complete their degrees. And a grant means also a new program that otherwise can be too expensive for your institution to support can then be initiated by you. So, why do you start now? And you need to start attending workshops and learning how to apply for grants already now. This is not a necessarily a skill taught at a very early stage in the career, but it's important to learn how to do this. So it's important why? Because you already mentioned it builds your credentials. You have to build a track record of funding if you want to stay in academia. You want to work on teams with more experienced researchers so that you know and you can learn how to apply for this. Like, for example, the NRF has an exchange um, opportunity that you can go to um, Europe to visit researchers that has obtained um, the European Research Council, the ERC grants, and then you learn from them how to write this because obtaining these grants are extremely um, challenging, but if you know how to write them and you know the right people, then you can get these types of grants more easily. Then, um, yeah, so learn from experienced people. Um, you need to develop a plan for long range, also for your personal development. And by planning your uh, research career, you need to include this type of um, learning how to apply for and write for funding grants um, very early on. So very remember, this is very, very important. Um, funding, when you apply for this, your interest needs to match that of the funding agency. So check that um, the project that you want to be funded fits in with the um, requirements of what types of projects they fund. And then very importantly, no matter how good your idea and how well written your proposal, if the agency to which you are applying is not interested in your project, you will not be funded. So remember this, check and read the guidelines very, very carefully. Now let us ask now two, sometimes two questions that we commonly ask when we start looking for funding. Where is the money? And where do I apply for this? Now, sometimes universities has like subscriptions to search engines called like um, research professional or open for research that you can actually search for funding and you can set the search criteria. For example, you want to look for fellowships, um, for example, or you want to look for travel grants and then these types of resources allows you to look and get a uh, funding opportunities that are available and their deadline dates and their documents all on one type of search system. So now let's look now, now that we know where to search for the funding and how to plan for this and why it is so important to apply for funding. So where does the money actually come from? It can either come from the public, the government, uh, 
uh, universities sometimes offer also um, funds for student or travel grants. Um, the NRF is a good source of funding. Sometimes the NRF also have bi bilateral agreements, actually a lot with different countries. There's a lot of different opportunities on the NRF webpage. There's also international opportunities, um, various um, international opportunities that you can apply for. For example, postdoc fellowships by the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship is a very prestige. Uh, um, highly esteemed, uh, very prestigious fellowship. Um, and one needs to learn how to apply for these things, because if you know the tricks of the trade, you will be uh, more easily um, able to get this. Then also, as I said, sometimes there's funding available for from um, corporations, industries, sometimes voluntary agencies, but this all depends on what you want funded. If you want, for example, to do a community project, there's some NGOs that may be able to fund you, but this all depends on the type of funding that you want. Also, it's good, like I said before, to apply um, to industry for funding because then you can get internships. Um, they can maybe also, um, it's a good opportunity to learn also what is the world like outside of the lab? How does industry operate? Can you, for example, develop a product for them and then they can fund you? And this can also open doors for you to get jobs. Now, um, some of these uh, funding priorities are usually based on personal philosophies and on the founding. Remember, remember what we said, when you apply for funding, align your project with the eligibility criteria or what the funder is actually funding. And some of these include the Robert Wood, the Kellogg Foundation, etc. Sometimes you will also see that the Nestle Foundation also funds uh, uh, research related to food. If you're in food science, they will fund you. Then corporations um, or industry, the testing or evaluation of their own products and something that advance the interest of the country. So again, you need to align your work with what the company is actually doing. OK. Then very, very, very important right at the beginning of your project and right at the beginning of your career, you need to start planning your whole research career, and this also interlinks with um, your planning for funding. So first ask yourself, um, as we discussed before, you will choose your discipline, your supervisor. Then you need to ask yourself, do I need preliminary data to apply for a research or do I need? Remember, research after funders will want to see that you are competent in a certain field, so you need publications for that. They want to see that if they give this person money, they will be actually be able to do this. You also need to ask yourself if you get the funding, um, is there lab space, is there um, students that you can uh, uh, give scholarships to? How is the setup of the environment that you work in? Can you be, be able to finish the things or the project effectively? Um, will you get seed money or starting a, a small seed starting grant? Um, Think about who will help you with this, because in research you need a lot of advice, you need a lot of help, you need a lot of mentoring, and this may come from supervisors, it may come from mentors, it may come from other postgraduate, more senior postdocs, etc. Then you have to think already now that you're in your year three, what grants did I receive? Did I get scholarships? There's many out there. What are my project goals? What strategic collaborations should I have? Now, by meaning strategic is what collaborations will help you. You need to think of building collaborations with different countries, more economically advanced countries and less economically um, less fortunate countries. So you need to think about all of these things. With which labs am I going to uh, make a collaboration? For example, work with good, excellent labs. This will also help you in your career. Then after some time, year five, for example, you need to think, what is the impact of my research been? How many publications, how many conferences, and what am I known for? OK, you need to build a kind of profile for yourself. Then you need to start also asking yourself again, this is all now in the planning phase before you start applying for the funding. What is your vision for your scholarly work? What contribution to the field are you hoping to make? 
Do you have some preliminary results? Have you established collaborations? Are these local? Are these international? Right? Are you well informed about prior results in the field? Remember what we talked about the literature search. This is important. What will the funding allow you to do? Will it help to further your career? Will it fund your salary? Will it allow you to visit the lab abroad? Will it buy, allow you to buy equipments? Will it allow you to do a project? Uh, will it allow you to buy consumables, go to conferences, publish? Will it help you to develop a course? Or will it help you to travel to either a conference or a workshop or a lab visit abroad now again we're still in the planning phase right we ask ourselves now what is the problem that we want to fix what is the research problem remember the problem that we need to fix need to be exciting it needs to be novel it needs to be applied so think about grand research that is novel this is what funders fund something for example that addresses a sustainable development goal you have to clearly think about how your work is going to contribute to the gap that is there in the knowledge or that needs to address some big challenge like for example climate change or hunger or peace okay think about the world's problems then what do you want to do about it and how are you going to do this? What methodology are you going to use? Is this methodology uh, solid? Is there gaps in it? Then who's going to do it? <clears throat> Very importantly, how much will it cost? You need to find out the chemicals that you're going to use, the equipments that you're going to use. How much is this going to cost? For example, if you need to go to another university to use another technique there, for example, electron microscopy, you need to understand what are the fees per sample. Then you need to budget for this. When will it occur? Will it occur this year? Will it occur next year? Does it fit in with the mission of the funder? This is very important. Your work or your project needs to fit in with what the funder is funding. If, you, it's, if it's not, then this funder will not give you money. OK, also think about who will be involved in the grant writing and who will be administering the grant. Is it your university or is it some university abroad that you will be having a collaboration? Now, still in the planning phase, very importantly, you need to learn to write well. So get experience in conducting research and writing well. Identify a research area. This is important, that is of interest, that is novel, and that you are passionate about. Remember, if you're not going to do something that you like, you're going to struggle. You need to do something that you really like. Remember what we discussed about the literature review, using the correct keywords, using different search engines. This is important. You need to know what is the knowledge that has been done on this and where's the gaps. If you don't read widely, you can miss important articles and then the funder will see, oh no, this is not really novel. And then they kick it out. Remember, this is very important. If you not put effort in with your application, it will just be kicked out because these funders, sometimes you get uh, 4,000, tens of thousands applications and they will, for example, only read the abstract. And if some part of your application is not written well, they will not care because they think you don't care. So very, very important. You have to plan. You have to learn to write well. These people get tens of thousands of applications and yours are just one of them and it needs to stand out. OK. You can also learn how to present at professional meetings like conferences because there you will also get very valid feedback about your work. People will ask you questions or you may be having a conversation um, with someone that will open new doors for your research. You want to write articles, you want to submit them to good impact, high impact journals like uh, three plus impact factor journals. You can also, how you learn to write well is also if you review papers, review books, um, look, read papers in high impact journals so that you can see how people write and how people write well, right? Remember to start small first. You start funding for small projects so you can learn along the way. Collaborate with experienced researchers, okay? So 
Now, remember this. You can have a brilliant idea, but if you can't get them across, your ideas won't get you anywhere. So this is where the writing part come in. So if you write well, and you write clearly, and you, you really get your idea across, the funder will be impressed. Um, they will clearly understand what you want to achieve, and then they will give you funding, okay? So now we're still in the planning phase. We need to think when are you going to begin? So start the proposal early, at least one year. So look for funding that is available. Look at the deadline dates and start very early. You can work backwards from when you need the money. Let the project be the driver for how much funding you're seeking. And remember, you also need sometimes the university have internal funding deadlines. You have to meet those, right? Very importantly, also, you have to know your institution. Know your institution policies. Um, who can help you to prepare a budget? Is there specific rules and regulations of what to include in the budget? This may also sometimes be included in the funding guidelines. Do so you need to, sometimes you also need, or most of the time you need to include overheads. Um, and who can help you in the um, research and development office to write an effective proposal? Remember, sometimes there's people employed to help researchers write and um, they will also review the project and, and help you and say, OK, this is not clear. No, the budget needs a bit of work. No, the aim is not good, um, etc. And they will also have to look at the intellectual property aspects of this proposal. Now, um, if your research proposal involves human subjects and also animals, it's also very important. You need um, the ethical approval prior to conducting any types of research. This is very, very important. So apply for the ethical approval. There is also a whole process you need to visit. Um, there's some universities have uh, ethical approval um, websites where there is a series of documents that you need to download and complete. This will be your project overview. Some other documents will be your consent forms that patients have to be signed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the, on a specific website or the persons responsible for ethical approval will provide you guidance on the process. You also need to look at the deadline dates for when the institutional review board meet and review applications. So you need to submit an application before that time. So there's a lot of things to think about. Now that we're done um, with the planning type of phase, um, we want to know uh, searching for the grant. So um, when we search for the types of grants, we want to determine what type of grant you will be using and which is the most appropriate to fund your research. Remember, your research must be aligned with the funders' goals and aims or type of projects that they fund. Once you have identified the fund, very importantly, you need to read the instructions very carefully and follow the instructions exactly. So you want to read it. Sometimes these documents, especially if you apply for international funding, it is like a book you have to read almost, but you have to read it and reread it. Ask questions, contact the funder, ask them what if something is unclear and take time on this to really read the eligibility criteria. Um, they will describe how, for example, how you need to submit this. Sometimes um, if it's a smaller grant, the application documents may be less comprehensive. It may be a page or two, depending on if it's a small or very, very, very big grant where you apply for millions to cover funding of students or research, etc. So also find out um, in the guidelines if it's online submission and if you can normally nowadays most things are online submission. What documents are required in what format should they be like, for example, can you submit the project proposal in Word or should it be a PDF? Um, should it be separate or should it be combined all in one PDF? What other documents are required, for example, your CV, proof of um, employment, such things, uh, proof of ethical clearance. There's a lot of documents that will be verified in these forms, um, in the guidelines. Then very important, if you do online submission, uh, remember closer to the deadline date, 
the online submission system will be extremely busy. And remember to be careful to not submit on the same day because there may be problems. The internet may go off. Um, the online submission system may be, well, may can maybe have problems. So submit well in advance. Then you can also look at what the guidelines stipulate about different award levels. Very importantly, what is the evaluation criteria? So what do they look at in your proposal when they evaluate it? Do they look at, obviously they will look at novelty, they will look at significance of the problems. Um, sometimes they will also look, is there a gender aspect? Is there an innovation aspect? How well did you write your budget? How well is your methods written? Do you have a timeline? Do you have a contingency plan for when something may go wrong or equipment may fail? What is your contingency plan? How do you describe, for example, if you apply for a fellowship um, in another lab um, where you will visit the lab as a postdoc, etc., you need to outline who will be your supervisor there and if they are capable enough to um, lead you and supervise you. So there's different aspects that people, that the funding um, agency look at. So we'll have a, a more lengthy discussion about that later. And some other submission requirements, what is el eligibility, very important, check that. Or what should the pro format be? Um, sometimes they have specific, sometimes they will provide you with a Word document and then you just need to complete the information on this. Um, they will also look at how you plan your work. Um, and for that, you need to, for example, include a Gantt chart where you describe, um, for example, your milestones and your deliverables, what you will be achieving, for example, in month one. Uh, month one, will you, for example, perform the experiments in month one? Um, in And then towards month 10, you will be starting writing papers and publishing and going to conference, that kind of thing. And also, if something is unclear, ask the funder and they can clarify. OK, ask yourself now again, now that you found the funding, is this the, this the right source for you? Does your goal meet the funder's mission? Does the grant size fit your project? Will it cover your project to effectively complete it? Does the timing work? Is the funding only for a year? Is it for two years? Can I complete all this work in a year, in two years? What are the deadline dates? Am I eligible for this? Can I sign the required forms or does someone more senior need to sign this? Um, where do I go for additional questions? Will the grant be offered again next year in case I'm not successful this year? Will the deadline be extended? You can ask the funder that. And what happens next? after they receive my proposal. So ask yourself these types of questions. If you are unsure, contact the funder. It's better to ask than be unsure. Then now we're focusing on how to write your proposal. Right now you've chosen your funding, you prepared yourself, you planned, you attended writing workshops, you have your collaborators, you have your publications, you have your ethical approval. Now you actually want to start writing the project proposal. So you need to know who's going to read this. This is very important because you have to align your writing to the people who's going to read and fund this. First, you can start with the outline. You can use headings, for example, to guide your introduction and the different topics that you're going to cover. Remember, you have to write a story. So um, remember, write an outline. And for that purpose, you can ha add headings to guide your storyline. For example, you will give background. For example, say, for example, you're doing a project on uh, nanofluids for heat transfer systems, the development of nanofluids for heat transfer systems. Then you need to start your project proposals that um, outlining why is heat transfer systems so important, um, where are they used, um, for example, um, and then you need to outline what are the problems in the current system and why is nanofluid so effective for um, heat transfer? What, what properties do they have that contribute to this? And then towards the third paragraph, you will focus on um, 
how do you develop these nanofluids and what properties contribute to increasing heat transfer and then you will outline where's the gaps what fluids haven't been used yet um, uh, you can maybe if your project is about how you synthesize different um, nanofluids to increase the heat transfer then you can include that uh, for example the synthesis technique has not been used yet and then this leads to the aim and objectives of your study right remember you need to prepare several drafts this is very important ask your colleagues for comments you can write writing resources there's a lot of books and papers available on how to help you write a grant and then remember to answer the reviewer questions okay let's look now at this what is commonly used selection criteria right so what do they look at when they review your proposal and already when you are starting writing your proposal you need to keep these things in mind so the selection criteria are used by the applicant to shape or design their project and it's also you can also use this when you review your own project and see if it's good enough where you need to tweak it a little bit and these types of selection are or the criteria um, is also used when they finally review your, your project and give it a score, right? So they will look at the quality of the project, the design, the excellence, um, the quality of the methods being used. Is this relevant? Could you have used more reliable methods? Could you have used a combination of methods? Is your sample size enough to read statistical uh, uh, analysis that you do, for example, a power test to see if your sample size is big enough to get to read statistical significance? Um, how is your statistical analysis plan? They will look at all the different aspects of your methodology. What is um, the need for the project? Do you outline clearly the magnitude and the severity of the problem that will be addressed? Uh, what is the significance of your problem? This is very, very important. So they look at this and they will score you on this. So this you already need to think about. What is the quality of the management plan? So this is your timeline, how you're going to manage all of these tasks. Is there um, appropriate milestones included? And what are your deliverables? Is this achievable? Do you have a contingency plan, for example, when things go wrong? How will you resolve this then? Um, what is the quali quality of project services? And sometimes they will also score this. Um, then who will be involved in the project? They will also look at the quality of the personnel and the environment that you're going to do the work in, especially sometimes for the Mercury fellowships. They will ask you to outline details about the facility, if they've published, if they have grants, they will also ask details about your supervisor, whether he or she has obtained previous Marie Curie uh, fellowship supervisory types of um, uh, students um, that has been successful applicants, um, also what, what, what grants that they received, how many publications, how many students have they supervised, do they teach, these kind of things. So they will ask for this and they will score you on this. Also on the adequacy of resources, is the environment okay for you to successfully complete the project? So now let's look at the tricks of the trades. So you will want to identify a project officer will address your questions. So normally the research office can help you with this. Sometimes there's also in, in, in the specific funder that you are applying to, they will have a project officer. Uh, and then you can also request a 15 minute conversation. Um, you can attach a one page uh, summary also that will make it easier for them to understand the project. Um, only ask questions not provided on website or in guidelines. If the question, if the information is already in the guideline, then there's no need to ask the project officer this. Right. Will they provide technical assistance? Um, very important. Do you have to pay for this service? This can sometimes um, I know people always sometimes send their work to be reviewed by 
um, some project officer and they have to pay uh, uh, quite a, a fee for this. So really think of the funder as a resource for you. Then here's a, a sample email that you write. Dear Dr. So-and-so, I am so-and-so of this department at your institution and I'm preparing a submission for the upcoming competition or grant. I've attached a brief description of my planned project and would greatly appreciate your feedback on the fit of your program. I would really like to set up a call to discuss your feedback and would, of course, make of myself available at your convenience. Thank you in advance for your time and advice and then your name and then you wait for the reply. If you don't, then you can just follow up again. Now, let us look at a little bit more of the specific tips to follow. You will want to allow plenty of time to prepare. Um, approximately depending on how skilled you are, 24 to 40 hours is needed. You want to read the application package. If you have any questions, again, contact the funder. The writing style is also very important. Um, schedule a timeline for this, factor into your schedule time, writing the multiple drafts, gather relevant and permissible materials, um, prepare critique. You can also critique your own. Uh, a proposal or you can ask others to help you to critique this. Um, for example, your supervisor or other postgraduate uh, student or more senior staff that in the lab with you. You can also use note cards. Remember, you're going to write, rewrite and rewrite again. And you can plan this according to a schedule. For example, you can say in month one, you're going to write the background. In month two, you're going to write the methods, etc. Remember, the well-written proposal should be clear. It should be very focused and it should be pro 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 very precise. Very important. A poorly written proposal has the potential to limit the chances of having a competitive idea funded. So very, very important. You may have an amazing idea, but if it's poorly written, it may not be funded. OK, so now let's focus when you're writing. Let's look at your style of writing. Now, what do we mean by style of writing? You format it according to the guidelines. You will write for the general public, remember? So someone that is not so knowledgeable in your field will read this. So you need to clarify certain terms, right? You want to use the third person as well. You don't want to use any jargon. You want to be very concise. You want to, the first sentence introduces your main point. For example, when you start the proposal, you want to have a first sentence introducing the main point, OK? You want to have also a spell check. You want to use sentences that is approximately 17 to 23 words long. You want to start paragraphs with clear and informative topic sentences. And you want to think about style as well. This is very important. And know when to avoid highly technical language. Very important. So when we look at the paragraphs, very important. Keep the paragraph short. Use headings for this. Very important. You can also use subheadings. Remember also your sentences shouldn't be too long, but then it reads very difficult. OK, rational documented facts. You don't want to show emotion and feeling about this, OK? You can use tables and graphs to be visual. You can use bullet points. This is a bit easier to read and you want to avoid abbreviations, acronyms and jargon, OK? So this is all tips that you need to think about when you write. Keep the paragraph short, no long sentences. When you start your proposal, you'll have a first sentence that introduces your project and the problem that you're going to address. Remember, your paragraphs need to flow into one another. You want to start the paragraph with a topic sentence and then sentences supporting that. And then you conclude the paragraph with the sentence that will lead to the next paragraph. OK, let's look at tips, more tips for now writing your proposal. You want to prepare figures and tables and images before you write the proposal even. Be very accurate and clear in your writing. And if you're using terminologies not very familiar with a type of general audience or 
uh, funders who are going to review your proposal who may not be necessarily familiar with your field. You want to explain certain terms, OK, but not too much. Remember, a funding proposal is not a literature review, OK? Remember also the proposal should look like one person wrote it, OK? Um, so keep the writing style consistent. One person should be responsible for coordinating proposal planning and show that funding the proposal will benefit many. It will have a social benefit, OK? Then you want to review and critique your proposal and you want to allow enough time for review. You want to use perhaps an external reviewer. You want to contact your supervisor. You want to contact your co-supervisor or you can work with postdocs in the lab to check if the writing is good or not. OK, so always work with more senior people than yourself to check is the writing good. For example, if you're writing a fellowship, ask someone more knowledgeable or a scholarship application. Is this good enough where you can add, where you can change? OK. Then look for logic gaps in your writing or your information that you provide. Is something unclear? Remember also when you use certain words, don't use vague words. Use words that are really clear for someone else to understand. Then also read your sentences out loud because then you can hear if the writing is understandable. OK. Then again, um, you may ask, you want to ask yourself, um, does it fit the criteria? Again, ask yourself, does it make sense um, that you convey that you are credible to do this? Um, is the budget appropriate to meet the goals? Did you follow the rules? OK, then you ask yourself again, um, very important. Remember, you have to remember your audience, the people who's going to review this. So don't deviate from the guidance. They set the order of the sections and the title. They set the rules and they have the money. So you have to be very detailed, even to the point of being elementary, and you need to be very concise. So when you write, for example, sentences, use it, write it in the shortest possible um, Passion, because if you write long sentences, it's sometimes difficult to read and comprehend. OK, put yourself in the funding sources shoes. Ask yourself some questions that a skeptical reader would ask. Why should anyone bother to fund or even read this? Why should they care? What differences is this going to make? So presented in a layperson's words, the program officer will not be an expert in your field and they have to explain the proposal to others. So remember these very valid points. Again, we're still focusing on your audience who's going to read this. You have to show in your proposal that your work will impact. It, ha it will have a, some kind of impact. Remember, there's also um, not all research is um, applied. So if there is funding um, proposals available that funds um, fundamental or basic research, you will have to emphasize how this fundamental research will contribute in future to applied research. If you're doing applied research, how will this impact real people and communities or advanced technologies? Um, Emphasize also collaborative nature of process and outcome. Show how you included your target audience in the planning stage. This will also be very diff uh, discipline specific. Um, and find a novel way of looking at the situation. You have to write it in a very interesting and enticing way so that the, re the reviewer or the funder will really want to fund this. OK, show a plan for sustainability and continuation. This is very important that this project is sustainable. It will lead to future research as well that will build on this. Ask yourself again, does it make sense the whole proposal? Can a reviewer quickly understand the type of problem you want to address and the solution that you want to achieve? Is there flow in your writing? Do you tell a story, right? This is very important. Um, remember, like we said, talk to the funder, talk to your senior um, staff and ask for advice. Don't plagiarize. Whenever you're stating a fact, you have to reference it and you have to write it in your own words. This is very, very important, right? Now let's focus in a bit more detail. 
on the specific parts of the proposal. Now, the, the previous sections we discussed is just general about what you should be cognizant about when you're writing the proposal, but now we'll be focusing on the specific parts, and this may differ from funder to funder. OK, for example, if you are applying for a Marie Curie Fellowship, for example, you will have a background section and in there they will outline. For example, you need to to mention what is the innovative aspects? Is there a gender aspect? Um, what is the novelty of this? This is very important. They look at three things, novelty, innovation, and if there's a gender aspect, how you write your aims and your objectives and your hypothesis, then there will also be a section on how this, for example, if you want to apply for fellowships to go overseas or do a postdoc, you have to include how will this position or this funding enhance your career? What will you gain from visiting this lab? Is there equipment? Is there knowledge that the supervisor has that will be good for your career development that is not in South Africa? Then also you will need to include a section on, for example, the capability of your supervisor and the environment that you'll be working in. Um, you will have to include, obviously, your methods and the timelines. What are your deliverables? They very critically look at this. Is this manageable? Will you be able to complete this in time? Do you have a contingency plan? Is there any ethical issues with the research? Do you collaborate with sensitive countries? All these things you need to look at. Did, did you apply, for example, if you're going to work with humans? Are they are you do you have ethical clearance? Um, justify your funding um, request according to the proposed project activity. So this is now um, when you are looking at the specific um, project uh, proposal parts, you have to proofread it. Um, be, be very careful about the language again. Remember what we talked about writing um, and how you structure this. So, so very, very important, the structuring, the formatting, the writing. So let's look at the different sections now. You will have a cover letter, you will have an abstract. Some people also um, uh, use synopsis. This is a bit different from an abstract. Um, introduction you'll have, you will have a needs or a problem statement, right? Then you'll have your project descriptions with your goals. Sometimes the timeline will be in the project description. Sometimes it will be as a separate um, a heading in the application where you have to include like, for example, a Gantt chart or an Excel chart uh, explaining your planning and your timing and your project management. Um, what is your methods? Um, what is your sustainability plan, your budget, and any other appendices that you want to? Remember, this depends and differs from funder to funder, but generally, this is what you will find in most funding applications. Then, template for the research plan is you will have an abstract. Um, they will already provide you this and you will have just have to include in the word document the abstract, the specific aims and the research strategy. For example, where you outline the significance, the innovation and the approach for your different aims. Now, this may differ from template to template. Some people um, have a different section for the methodology. Uh, some people will request a completely different section for the aims where you state your hypothesis, your rationale for your literature, your preliminary data, your feasibility, your design, your outcomes and pitfalls and alternative plans. So this may be one type of example here. Um, you can also make a bulleted outline in your introduction. Um, where normally you have the opening sentence grabbing the attention of the reader of what the actual problem is, the current knowledge and the gaps in knowledge. Then you focus on your goals. Uh, remember, there's a difference between the aim and the objectives. Aims are more broad, whereas objectives is more specific. And then you will have to include in, for example, in your aim one hypothesis, methods, experiments and results. So these are all different templates. This may differ. But this is um, just a general guide. OK, here's another one. For example, they will include a template where you have to say your aim, you will state your hypothesis, you will provide the literature, the impact, preliminary data, experimental design, outcomes, etc. Then you will have to write the cover letter, right? 
So remember, we brief and to the point, use the same date when you'll send the complete grant application to the funding source, open with a contact person name and title, followed by the funding source and the address, etc. Greet the person by the name, not dear sir or a colleague or, or uh, anything like that. Use the specific surname and then keep the first and second paragraph short. And then normally you wrap up the cover letter with a synopsis or a summarizing paragraph where you bring it all together. Right, what is this work about and why are you applying for funding for this? And then at the bottom, you may want to include attachment if the funder is requesting like, for example, a CV, etc. So now we're looking at the proposal title. So now we're done with the cover letter. Now we look at the title. So remember when you write titles, it needs to be compelling and informative. It needs to be relatively short, descriptive and jargon free. It should be sufficiently flexible and general to encompass not only the experiments you propose, but also other experiments. Titles should emphasize the payoff of your research. Now remember, um, titles for for example academic papers for reviews and for funding applications may differ for example for really for a funding application you want a title that is really compelling but it should also be informative enough so that the reviewer can grab this information at a, at a very first read okay and one could should also gain some aspect of the type of experiments that you're going that you're going to do, right? So here's some tips if we look at the abstract. Now we're focusing on the abstract specifically. It should briefly describe the needs that will be addressed. The services, for example, if you're doing community work, the population, if you, for example, working in a clinical trial or a medical study, um, if you're working in also medical studies, you may want to provide the demographic information of the population. Um, what is their general health? What is their um, job status? What are their age? Um, where do they live? Um, these types of information, what is their income, etc. How explain also how the project will overcome one or two or community barriers and demonstrate the feasibility. Now, this type of abstract is for community work or for medical research, right? If you're writing a scientific abstract, then you briefly describe the importance of this work or you emphasize the, 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 the gaps in knowledge and how you will address it and then the different methods that you will be using and then um, you end off, you conclude, right? So um, we're still on abstract. Um, now, sometimes they will specify how many words this will be. Um, this depends from funder to funder. Remember, the abstract is the very, very most important part of your proposal because this is what the reviewers of the funder will read firstly. It must be succinct, it must be pithy, it must convey all the specific aims, etc. So it must be really, it must really encapsulate the body of the work. Then you can also ask senior colleagues to review this. Does it make sense? Does you do you encapsulate the whole um, essence of the study? Um, remember, the document must kind of, or this section must kind of pass what we call the grandma test. It should be clear, compelling, understandable. Your goal is not to impress the study section in with your in-depth knowledge of the subject. Okay, so remember that. Then there will also be a section called a needs or problem statement where you analyze the situation using the best data you have available. You provide an analysis of the problem and how you plan on addressing it and the strengths and weaknesses, for example, of your current situation, um, or you establish the community need, not your organization's need. So this is more for community type of work, okay? So how you state your problem statement will depend on your discipline that you're in. Now let's look here. Here is an, some examples of a problem statement. Look at this one. Many of the children we will be serving come from families with a lower income. The daycares we are partnering with uh, mainly the lower income kids. By us partnering with uh, them, the kids will have access to books. They wouldn't usually be able to be in contact with. Now, the writing style is very inf informal. It's not very professional. And this did not get funding. 
Okay, now let's look at this one. This one was approved for funding. In the year 2020, our school year, 90% of our kindergarten students qualified for free reduced lunch. They don't use the work kids, they use students. At the beginning of the school year, 68 did not meet the benchmark of this. 90% of our preschool and kindergarten students have developmental disabilities. 23 of the kindergarten are English language learners. These children must have access to books in order to better be prepared when they enter kindergarten, and we can provide them through this program if our application is accepted. So they provide your dates. They provide you a context that there's a lot of children that are in need of reading books. So really they are emphasizing the problem here and why they need books to develop them. You see, this is why this type of problem statement was approved and this project was approved for funding because they provided a context and how this funding will benefit them. OK, in a very clear and a very succinct way. OK, now. Let's look at how to write the project description. So this needs to be specific, it needs to be measurable, it needs to be attainable, it needs to be realistic, and it needs to be time bound. OK, remember this. Now that we all um, went through all of these sections in the propo uh, proposal, we actually get to the project description. Right, so the project description should contain a very clear description of the activities you plan to conduct to move toward the goals and objectives you have stated. OK, very important. The reader should easily see how you are going to accomplish your goal. You can use timelines, words, charts to help you. Paint a picture of how the research will look through the eyes of your target population. Don't make the funder guess. You want to be clear. You want to convince them to fund this project. Sometimes people will also include the significance. This may also be very important. It shouldn't be long and you can provide it into different parts, um, what will be the benefits of your work. This is a very, very important section that you need to outline what this work will actually, what is the outcomes, what is the significance, why should the funder fund this? So very, very, very important. Explain the importance of the problem, the barrier to progress in the field that the project will address. Explain how the proposed project will improve knowledge, technical capability, maybe you want to improve a, me a method or the clinical practice if you're going to do a clinical trial, for example. Describe how the concepts, methods, technologies, treatment services or preventative interventions that drive this field will be changed. OK, sometimes depending on what type of project you are doing, they will, they will also ask you to include a section on innovation. Does this project contribute to innovation? Innovation is a very, very important aspect in some fields. You'll have to explain how the application challenges or seeks to shift current research or clinical practice paradigms. Describe any novel theoretical concepts, approach or methodologies, instrumentation, if for example, um, if you're doing, for example, um, a psychological study, you will be using a test battery for this. Um, uh, how you will take advantage of existing methodologies, instrumentation, intervention, and how does this differ from previous work? Explain any refinements, improvements, or new applications of theoretical concepts, approaches, or methodologies, instrumentation, or interventions. What is the norm? If these methods are established, you need to provide a citation. How does your approach depart from the status quo? Is it a paradigm shift? And how will this departure project to fundamental progress in this field? What will you innovate? OK, maybe there's a difference between significance and innovation. So significance is the positive effect that something is likely to have on other things. Innovation is a new and substantially different way of considering and addressing something which results in positive change. Let's look at, we already discussed this, for example, if you're doing community work, there will need to be a, a section. This is important to say that, mention that your work is sustainable. It will lead to future research. It will benefit the program. It will build awareness and support. It, it originates from accomplishment of goals and objectives. 
um, and the importance of methods to achieve the sustainability. What will you use, for example, if you're doing a community project, how to build relationship, how to expose the community and how to really involve them. OK, and when you're working with indigenous communities, it's very important to respect um, the culture and also um, respect the um, their background. This is very important. So sometimes um, if you work with indigenous communities, it will be especially if you're coming from research, it's a foreign field, so you need to explain it in the local language and have respect if you involve such a community in your work. So be very respectful um, and also to fully involve them in the success of this work. OK, so now that we're done, let's focus on the methods. So now um, you will want to check or you'll be using internal or external equipment, equipments abroad that is not available here. What is the cost? Um, this type of thing you also need to think about. Will you use quantitative and qualitative data? What will your research design be? This is very important also in medical research, for example. Will you be doing a retrospective review, a clinical trial, a longitudinal study? Um, what will you be actually doing? The design of the work. Um, how will the evaluation or methods be performed? What data will be collected and how will it be analyzed and shared? This is very important. Sometimes, uh, for example, in the Marie Curie applications, they will ask you, how do you plan to disseminate data? And then you need to outline that you will publish it in academic papers. You will have um, uh, you will attend conferences, but then you also need to attend that you will mention that you will attend, um, you will visit schools um, uh, to outline the popular communication aspect of the work, not, not only the academic and to which science festivals you will attend to popularize your work. So that's important to have a broad scope of how you will share the data. Open data sharing is also very important. Um, will you be depositing in, a, in an open access repository so that other people can also use the data? Very important when you're working with patient data, you need to mention that it will be anonymized and how will it be anonymized and stored? OK. So describe the overall strategy of the methods. Um, how you will do the analysis, how to, and remember this has to fit in to achieve the aims of your projects. So when you write, everything needs to form a coherent role. It needs to link back with the aims. Also the data, how the data will be collected and analyzed also need to link back to the aims. You also need to mention there will be a separate section in some of these uh, funding applications where you can outline, for example, the Marie Curie application will ask you to discuss potential problems, how you will address alternative strategies um, and to achieve success in this project. Um, if the project is in the early stages of development, you will describe any strategy to establish feasibility and trace the management of any high risk aspects. Then um, point out any procedures, situations or chemicals, very importantly, that may be hazardous. OK, in some funding applications, they may request this. Is there anything that may be unethical? Or that may be create a uh, a sensitive situation in, in, in the lab environment. Then you also need to include the literature. Obviously, when you're writing the project proposal, your background will be supported by literature, and this will mainly be cited in the body of your uh, proposal, mainly in the introduction sections, or maybe also sometimes in the methods, depending on whether the methods is established or not. The section, remember, is best put together as a part of the writing process of, so whilst you're writing, you're already start um, organizing your references and you can use programs like EndNote or Mendeley for this. Um, also remember, include the reference in full because sometimes if you use numbers, it can get very confusing when you start to edit and change the document. Then um, uh, in some applications, for example, the Marie Curie Fellowship, they will want to ask if the facility that you're going to is sufficient for you to do the work at. And then you will explain the facility, um, what type of publications um, it had, it has delivered, the collaborations, 
um, what types of facilities are available. Is there microscopes? Is there glassware? Is there what types of equipment is there? What type of consumables? Maybe less important, but the bigger equip equipment that you'll be using, you'll need to specify. Is there a computer and office space? How is the um, lab environment? So you need to comp uh, uh, clearly define that. Then the budget is also very um, important. Sometimes the funders will have guidelines for you to outline a very good uh, budget. It will help you plan the research um, and to also cover. Remember, also you can liaise with your research office to find out how um, you can um, what you should include so that you cover everything that you need to fund. For example, co uh, chemical consumables, um, laptops, funding for travel abroad, um, funding for um, open access publishing, funding for students. This will all depends on the criteria that the fund funds. Uh, you also sometimes will have to mention, um, do you already have internal funds or do you don't have any funds? Right, some of the direct indirect costs may include the salaries, um, the fringe benefits like health insurance, um, sometimes equipment, sometimes supplies, travel abroad, sometimes consultant services and open access publishing. Very important, but this all depends on what the actual funder funds and uh, the funder will also provide guidelines what actually they fund and then you need to make sure you cover this in the budget. Um, as we already mentioned, you can also include funding for students if you're more a senior person later on in your career. Then after the budget or sometimes before this, depending on the guideline and, and the application documents, you will have to include like um, a Gantt chart or Excel sheet where you outline how your project will be managed. For example, in year one, you'll do this and this and this and you need to include specific milestones and deliverables and um, your contingency plan. What will you do if something fails? Then you have to include your CV or your personal statement. This is also a separate section. And remember the format of the CV and the personal statement may differ um, from funder to funder. You will have to include your academic history, your background, your special achievements, your publications, conferences attended, students supervised. Um, you must uh, justify the importance of your experience that really applies to this grant. For example, um, in the Marie Curie types of applications, they will look at um, what is your experience and how will this fellowship help you to uh, grow in your career? The CV here is very important. Um, to align with that. Um, sometimes they will provide you standard forms. Sometimes they will also request you um, a bow sketch where you will outline your most significant contributions. Um, then remember each description can be accompanied by a listing of up to four relevant peer review publications, your most important um, uh, 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 publications in high impact journals. Um, non-publication um, research projects, including, uh, for example, patents, videos, databases, etc., etc. OK, then we're coming to the submission. Does the proposal meet the requirements? Do you have all the attachments? Remember, read and reread and critique your own proposal. Do not wait until the last minute. Wait, look at the internal deadlines. Do you need letters of support? Do you submit via the internet or do you email or how does this work? Remember, the system may be very slow on the last day. Um, so check that you submit well in advance. Sometimes common mistakes that um, Researchers make is they fail to allow enough time to submit. They don't read the application package. They don't follow the formatting guidelines and they fail to proofread. Now that you've submitted your application, 
it will be reviewed and the reviewers will look at different criteria. You can also ask the funder what is the criteria or what is the document that they use to score and then they can also get very useful tips. So they will obviously look at what is the significance and the sustainability. Some will look at is the innovation and gender aspect, how you will approach this, what is the methods, what, how you formulate your aims, um, what is the quality of the investigated, are they equipped? well equipped to do this work, uh, how is the lab environment or if you're going to another lab, how is the environment there? Um, they will ask and they will question what is the intellectual merit of this work? What is the broader impact? How well does this activity advance discovery? Um, if you're applying for a teaching a type of grant, how will it advance teaching? Um, maybe you will uh, initiate a new a novel teaching method or a new uh, interdisciplinary course, um, etc. So they will look at all these types of questions. Are the personnel senior? Are they well qualified? Is it feasible for the time um, dedicated to it? Is the requested funds enough? Um, so these are the, the types of questions they ask. So specifically for significance, they will ask uh, when they or they will think about when they read your work and your proposal now that you submitted it. Does the project address an important problem or critical barrier? If the aims of the project are achieved, how will scientific knowledge be improved? How will successful completion of the aims change the concepts or methods or technology? of what you are planning to do. And this all depends on your field and your aims of the project. So um, maybe you'll develop a new technology, maybe you'll develop a new treatment. How will this advance the field? Then they will look at the investigator you. Are you early stage? Remember some of these grants are specifically dedicated. They will mention in the eligibility criteria that these are for early stage young investigators. Um, do they have appropriate uh, experience in training? For example, if you apply for some fellowships, you will need to stipulate that how will this opportunity develop your career? Um, for example, you will exchange knowledge uh, with a different lab that has expertise in a skill that you don't have or in a field you don't have. Um, if the project is collaborative or multi, do the investigators have complementary and integrated expertise? What is their leadership approach and governance and organizational structure of the university? Also, they will look at innovation. This is not for all grants, but some have uh, will, will need an innovation component. Does the application challenge and seek to shift current research or clinical practice? Are the concept approaches, methodologies, instrumentation or interventions novel? So these are the types of questions they ask and your methodology. Is this sufficient to achieve your aims? Will there be potential problems? What are the alternative strategies? Um, if the project involves, for example, you're going to do a clinical trial of a new medicine, is there plans to protect the human participants from risk? Is there inclusion of minors, members of both gender? So always remember diversity and inclusion is very important nowadays in grant application. Um, if you include children, for example, you need consent approval um, and you need to complete such or submit such forms to the eth ethical approval office um, where the adults need to sign this because the children are minor. So there's a lot of different things to think about. Um, also the environment, what is the institutional support environment? Um, are the equipment functioning? Um, how different, what types of equipments are available? Um, what is the lab setup? What is the expertise of the supervisor? If you're going to do a fellowship, for example, abroad. Then the scoring, this is example of a scoring chart where they will look at the significance, for example, the investigator, the strengths and the weaknesses. Normally they will pull, they will define the strengths and the weaknesses. Sometimes they will have a scoring card where they will just give a score. So this is example of one type. Um, sometimes they will give you a score on a certain aspect that your innovation aspect is exceptional, outstanding, excellent. Um, they will look at different areas of your proposal, your aims, 
They will look at the investigators, are they well enough? They will look at the methods or, or if you have innovation, what does this entail? If it's exceptional, they will give you a score of one. And then it's groundbreaking. You use groundbreaking approaches and methods and, and this is really novel. So they will score you on this. And remember, for some of these uh, grants, they will give you a score on each section for your background, for your methods, uh, for your project management. And if you lose a point on one of them, it can hugely affect your overall score and then you may fail it. Because to get the grant, in some, some funders will need you to achieve a certain score in order to be able to be successful. So remember this, each section, in your funding application is extremely important. You can write an excellent introduction, but if your budget is not good or if your project management is not good or if the supervisor, for example, if you're going to do a fellowship abroad, if he's not equipped to supervise you in the lab environment, it doesn't have the necessary equipment, you can fail the application. So each section you have to handle with extreme care. That is why starting very early is extremely important. And remember again, your idea has to match what the funder is funding, right? Very important. Let's look here at reasons for not receiving the grant. Sometimes it's just the nature of the project. Um, and honestly, sometimes there's a lot of um, politics in the research in environment. Sometimes you will get a reviewer. This unfortunately happens that you will get a reviewer. He simply doesn't like the lab or the work, or maybe he could do the work himself and then he decides, OK, no, let's reject. So there's a lot of lot of different reasons uh, for this. Don't be discouraged if your project gets rejected. Just apply again and ask for feedback and advice on how you can improve it. Um, inadequate planning is sometimes mostly responsible. Um, also, the competency of the applicant if they're not well, uh, if they haven't published enough, etc. And uh, sometimes even higher the score if the nature of the project if they don't like this. Okay, so. Um, it's important for you also to follow up to check when you will be receiving information on whether you have been successful or not. You want to write a thank you note. Um, if successfully funded, um, you will get a type of grant award. Award. You will need to read this very carefully. You need to liaise with the research office. Um, you need to rewrite. You need to resubmit, and you also need to explore other funding opportunities if all else fails. Now let's look at some. So there's a lot of things we covered today. I would advise you to go through this again in your own time because normally it takes, if you're unfamiliar with this type of uh, work, it's always good to go back to the presentation. Um, I've shared it with Samu and go back to the presentation and just go through it once again to accumulate all of this knowledge. So in general, you get, if you look at the summary of all of this, you get different types of funding applications. You get for scholarships, you get for equipments, you get for research and you get for travel and you get for, what is the other one now? Yeah, so there's a whole broad range of scope. For example, if you're applying to travel to a conference, you need to motivate why this conference is good for your career. What will you gain from attending this conference? If you're applying for a scholarship or a fellowship, you need to motivate why is this important for you? How will it develop your career? If you're visiting a lab abroad, you need to outline um, how will this lab benefit your career because it has expertise um, that may not be available here or it has equipment um, that is maybe not here or there. So you need to think about these things. Um, also, if you apply for these like DART fellowships and things, you have to very clearly you, right it's very important how you write your cv because they want to see that this fellowship will benefit the student because she he or she doesn't have this in the skill or doesn't have this access or this this level really complement the project that the person is doing to develop their career 
If you're applying for research funding, your project has to be novel. It needs to address some sustainability development goal. If you're applying for equipment, you really need to motivate the need for that equipment. Um, it may not be available here, or you may not have access to it in your region. You need to clearly explain why is this equipment required, how many students will use it, how many research will use it, how many projects will be involved, etc. Remember to start early, learn to write. This is very important because if you cannot write, it's difficult to get your message across. Talk to successful applicants. You want to collaborate with successful people. You want to read the guidelines. Um, this is very important. Um, remember different funding, different disciplines have different requirements, different forms. Um, don't give up. If you're not successful, you try and try again. Now, example is there was a news article. Oh no, this is what someone told me actually. That this group was a research lab overseas. They were extremely excited. They were uh, advertised in the news. Um, There's a great celebration. They got a very, very big, um, I think it was a European grant. And then sometimes one may feel, while well, this specific researcher was very kind of saddened, um, he told me, yeah, but I've been trying for this and I never get this, so why do they get this? But what people don't sometimes understand that these people actually applied for 10 years. So it took them 10 years. Every year they applied and in the 10th year only they got the grant. So don't give up. If you're unsuccessful, just keep on trying again. Ask for the funder for feedback. Um, and this can help you ask for advice from senior people, look at successful proposals that can guide you and keep on applying for the funds. This is important for your career and scholarships, etc. So thank you very much for your attention.